All right, let's get some energy going. Let's have fun. We've got a fantastic panel for you this afternoon. So ladies and gentlemen, by way of quick introduction, my name is Henry Stimler. I have the delight and pleasure of hosting this panel on how to build a multifamily empire. Myself, I'm at Newmark. I'm an executive managing director. Myself and my team run one of the most successful and creative debt groups. Uh, we'll do this year about $4.7 billion of debt. Uh, a lot of the guys up here I've transacted with, and the ones that I haven't by the end of this panel will be my clients. So that's, there is a, there's a reason. So by way of I, I thought you were a professional MC. <laughs> <laughs> no, the English accent just gets me up here. OK, so who, who do we have up here, and why are they qualified to speak on this topic? So sitting in front of you guys, you have four of the number one multifamily owner operators in the country. And right now, we're going through an crazy time, so hopefully we can glean some insight in how they did they, their business, how they built their business, and also we're going through a cycle, and many of the young guys here haven't gone through a cycle, there's a lot of fear in the air, there's not a lot of optimism, and as Ralph said this morning, because he's a very wealthy man, he can say that, that he's very optimistic, but these guys also should give us some optimism, and if not, we'll get learn some things from them today. So by quick introduction, we have Joe Lubeck, founder, executive managing director of American Landmark, Joe has, bought portf a port has a master portfolio in his time of over 100,000 units with a value of access of $7 billion over the last 15 years. He's the original founder of Landmark American Trust, which sold its portfolio for $1.9 billion in 2015. He then came back into the market and rebuilt his portfolio. I believe, Joe, you have around 50,000 units today. Is that correct? 39. 39,000. OK, Norman Rado. Norman runs the Radco company. He established Radco in 1994. They have acquired, since 2011, they've acquired and invested in approximately 30,000 units in 15 markets, completed over 100 deals, totaling $3.2 billion. Norman also has a side hustle where he buys hotels. <laughs> side hustle. <laughs> Russ Appel. Russ uh, has been building his company since 1991. Before that, he was the vice chairman for Goldman Sachs for five years. He was involved in all of Goldman Sachs' real estate business, totaling over $3 billion. He went on and built Pradium, which I believe has bought how many units? He a doesn't lot, know. Too lot. many to even know how many, many units. Harry Bookie, who, lovely, thank you so much for coming, Harry. Harry has ownership of 60,000 units, but they also have a thriving management business of 106,000 units. They have 350 properties in 26 states. Last year, they were the seventh largest manager. They're a Freddie Impact sponsor and the award-winning management company. So we've established the pedigree is there. We have the right people on this panel. Let's jump right into it. While we want to talk about what you've achieved in the past, it would be rem remiss of me not to discuss what's going on now in, and how you feel about 2023. Where do you think the market will be? What are you doing to protect your downside? Joe, can we start with you? Where do you think 2023 is going to leave us? Also, on your current portfolio, how is your current portfolio looking? So I'm pleased to say that the portfolio is looking great. Um, obviously, we've come out of a strong bull market, but uh, as they say, this isn't my first rodeo. So I'm cautiously optimistic, although I say that when times are good, I say that when times are bad. But I think multifamily is still the best risk-adjusted space to be in, and people are going to have to adjust to what I consider normalcy. You know, a lot of people think the last few years were normal. The last few years were abnormal. Russ, what about yourself? What do you, how do you see 2023? <laughs> how are you going to take advantage of the market? I, I think we're different than some of the others. We sold three quarters of our portfolio at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. So we're, we're also optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just got to figure we're out also, where to... We're like Ralph. We're optimistic. But, <laughs> but um, you know, look, we're going through a transition. And, and I, Joe, agree with you. You know, we had sort of this period of time where rates were very low and uh, rents were, you know, increased at a, at a crazy rate, and, and, and we're all well positioned because of that right now. Harry, what about you? You have 100,000 units out there. How's it looking for you? Well, the, you know, the portfolio is, done, is doing well, uh, but I'm kind of in the middle of these two. I'm, I'm not optimistic, and I'm not pessimistic. So just The way I look at it is, on the, on the negative side, we're in a world war. We have inflation that, that for which the employers or, or employees are not uh, increasing their, their uh, salaries at the same rates. We have high rates. We have political strife. We have work at home, which might change the dynamics of our industry. 
We have shortages of construction. We have dollars is way too strong, and most of, a lot of the money is coming in from overseas. We have uh, just there's costs of operations are very high and are going to be higher from insurance and so forth and so on. On the good side, no, there is that. God, there's a good side. There's a very good side. I was literally about to rip more. As much as we uh, hate each the other, good side is uh, rates are higher. Yeah. <laughs> as much as we all hate each other because, politically, uh, at the same time, uh, the United States is still the best uh, bet in the world because uh, you got South America's a mess. Uh, there's negative interest rates in Europe. Nobody wants to deal with China anymore, and Asia's a mess. Harry, do you think the election tomorrow, no matter how it goes, do you think it's going to impact your business? I, I really, I don't think so, no. But like I say, as much as people are in strife with each other, uh, at the same time, you have a situation where, uh, you know, as much as we don't like each other, it's people still have to live, they're still gonna move on, and this is the way it's been. So you, the answer is I don't think so. Do you think, Joe, do you think uh, it'll change? The election think, tomorrow I will change? I think the outcome is very relevant, but I won't state which one I prefer. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not, not what you prefer, but just do you think it's gonna change your in, business? In, if, in all if, sincerity, I, you know, people ask am I Democrat or Republican, I say I'm a capitalist. And I think it's pretty clear where the capitalist allegiances lie. So what's good for capitalism and what's good for business, I think, is good for our business. I'm just going to yeah. step on the stage and let Russ take over, guys. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I don't have an, you, I don't have an say, accent, though. You, you know, Joe, you say that and it sounds Norman. good. Joe, you say that and that sounds good, but uh, it, it's um, uh, under the Democratic leadership that, and this is not a political statement, but a factual one. It sounds like one. When you have <laughs> higher inflation, uh, it's the multifamily owner's friend. So it's generally been a Democrat. Why, why is inflation the multi-owner's friend? Because rents go up. But we've seen that rents have plateaued across many markets, so that thesis doesn't pan out. How do you explain that? Because they've gone up 20% per year the last two years, so uh, they, they're taking a breather. But let's hear from you, Norman. How, so what your 2023 view is what? Well, first here, here, is, wait, wait, let's just first is, summarize. Me, Optimistic, God. we don't know. <laughs> but maybe. Thank God, thank God we're on the first floor and there are no windows. Because after hearing Harry, I would have jumped. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> so, so, thank God. But so, you didn't hear my good stuff. So. <laughs> we heard so, that you've got no choice. We've got to live together and people no, have to rent apartments. No, but everything we, else is freaking terrible. I, I no, no, I want to hear his good side. I had other uh, items. No, no, I'm so, after Norman goes, we need to hear your good side. So, as, as Henry said, we uh, built a portfolio of uh, almost 30,000 units. We sold them all but 1,000 units in the last two years. Um, so, um, uh, no wonder you're so well dressed. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so I'm very optimistic about uh, this coming year because we have the capital, we have the infrastructure, we have the reputation relationships, like all of you do here. And we think we're poised for you know, some really uh, unique opportunities coming up uh, in, the ne in this next cycle. The question is, well, how's that going to look like? And the answer is, I don't know. And I don't think any of us know how the cycle is going to play out. But the fact is, um, every cycle has its play. Uh, things are going to uh, even out. We're going to find a new bottom. And uh, we're going to find new ways to do business. And I want to do that with capital and my infrastructure intact. And that's where, how we position ourselves. So, so, so with that, that, kind, that kind of leads me to the next question. So 2023, incredibly high interest rates. How are you going to be competitive in a market where interest rates are very high, but cap rates haven't really that compressed that much? Florida is still maybe, let's say, mid four caps. Texas, mid four caps. How are you going to be competitive in this market and buy deals when you have these two opposing uh, statistics? So my answer is always the same. Low leverage and patience. And um, we survived beautifully through 06 and 09. Um, Norman and I were sharing earlier some of our best times for buying were 2008 through 2010, 2012 through 2013. Um, but you've got to be sitting on dry powder. We sold almost $2 billion this year, so it was very positive in terms of sales. But you've just got to pick your spots. And I hate to say it, but there is going to be distress, and the well-capitalized will ideally take advantage of that. But I don't see a debt solution yet. Um, so we're going to be looking for assumptions that are low leverage. 
I want to still want to hear Harry. Harry, Harry, tell us. I want to hear the optimistic What's side the, of <laughs> Harry. Come on, I'm well, sorry. Well, he says there is one. Let's find. Well, out. there is. Uh, the United States, number one, is still the best bet worldwide. So I think that's the strongest. Number two is there's a two million person short shortage, shortfall in units or uh, housing locations, uh, and the so and the rates are the rates are kind of high. So it makes uh, it makes it more difficult for people to do other uh, uh, ownership alternatives. So our our response to all that is that we are looking at other types of uh, situations. We're doing a lot of BTR. We're doing a lot of uh, senior. We're doing uh, some other uh, types of uh, housing that uh, allow us to be competitive. And we've just changed our underwriting to see if deals work in today's environment where we can uh, generate capital to supply it. So Joe's going to buy, Joe's sitting on a lot of money. He's going to buy low, he's going to buy using low leverage. He's going to look for advantages. Russ, what are you going to do in 2023 to acquire? You've also sold a lot. Are you going to sit on the sidelines? No, no, Are you going to no, go no. back we're, in? What are you going to do? Are you going to go on holiday? What's your plan? <laughs> <laughs> we're, listen, we're, we're, we're slow right now. We're slow right now. We, we just saw a 12 year period where you could almost do no wrong, right? Basically interest rates kept coming down, that's good for financial assets, it's been good, been good for us. We've seen an economic growth, so rents have generally gone up. So I think the world is not going to be as easy going forward, and we're just going to be more careful. But are you, just, just to follow up on that, so we've had 12 years of good, so you think we're going to have two years of bad, three years of bad, what, what, what is your your outlook for, for the bad. And when you say bad, I, I, what do you mean by bad? I, I, do you mean I don't know if it's bad. I think there's a reset going on. There's a little bit of a reset going on, right? Rates are higher. We don't know how much longer rates will be higher. I personally think that next year we'll probably, toward the end of the year, see rates start declining again. And that'll sort of make, make spur the economy to move, to move again. But right now, rates are higher. There's a little bit of a reset. Cap rates have risen, and they're likely to probably still be under pressure for a period of time. That may be opportunity. Maybe opportunity. Maybe so, opportunity. So there's always opportunity in good times and bad. Let's see what the opportunity is. Harry, what do you think is going to be the opportunity? Do you think you'll be on a buying spree, or do you think you're going to sit back and, and see how it goes? Well, in my 29 years of the business, there's been two years where I didn't do anything but there's been many years where we've done quite a bit. So we just um, work on our underwriting model uh, and determine whether or not we can make, make deals. If we can, we'll do it. And I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm a little bit up in the air as to whether we're gonna buy a lot this year or not, and whether or not these alternative investments, uh, housing investments like BTR and so forth. Well, uh, Why are they different? Why is BTR a better well, if alternative? Well, if you're a family with two kids, let's say, do you really want to stay in a 1,200 square foot apartment? Uh, and uh, the BTR situation is you're going to move into a townhome, you're going to have amenities, uh, you're going to, and, and you can't, the other we thing have, is these people, at, they can't afford, who can afford to buy a $600,000 house who's on a hundred thousand dollar income and, the, they and, your, and your mortgage is close to eight percent today but your are the economics rates are high better for you, you you're talking about the tenant what are the economics better for you in btr than they are in uh multifamily? they're similar they're similar yeah we're also in the btr space yeah. i you, think you the economics are similar, are similar. we have a we have a big and growing group the debt continues to be a problem we are starting to see some big advantages in um, entitled land positions that will help us grow the BTR. And I see them as a natural continuum. You know, in our entire portfolio, only 4%, by design, only 4% of our um, units are three bedroom. So we see the BTR as a logical continuum um, with the multifamily moving from a one bedroom and two bedroom into a three bedroom and four bedroom. But again, you know, the debt is, is stressing the environment right now. Um, some of the builders are going to become stressed in the BTR space, and some of the landowners are going to become stressed in the BTR space. So we hope to be able to take advantage of that. But, you know, I continue to say the emphasis really, I view this, while now it's a little bit of an aberration in terms of the interest rates, I agree with Russ, there will be a return, and the return is going to be a return to normalcy. Don't expect or underwrite or plan your business around 3% interest. You know, over my now 
I don't want to say how many years, but it's going on 40. Um, the average interest rates are 5 to 6 percent, and you need to find a way to operate and make money in that environment. Yeah, and a lot of the guys here in this room haven't seen that. They've been buying real estate over the last couple of years. They've seen traditionally incredibly low interest rates. They don't know that the actual norm is pretty much 5%. Norm, very quickly, come, come, coming to you, what are you what's your, where do you see the advantage in 2023? What's your plan? So I don't do, I don't do quickly, uh, but uh, what I do see is, let's go back one year. One year ago, cap rates compressed and they merged. A, B, and Cs were all 3% cap rates. I mean, there was no, there was no separation for risk at all. And so uh, it made no sense to me. And that's why we sold into, into that. Uh, what you're seeing now coming out of, uh, in Q2, you started to see those cap rates rise. But they still rose kind of in tandem uh, into the fours. Uh, and so we looked at that and said, this is a good time to pivot and buy core assets. Because if I'm going to you know, pay a four and a half or a five, I'd rather yep. buy something core than a C-class in a tertiary, uh, tertiary market. Now, what I think is going to happen um, is, oh, let's take a step back again. So last year, you have a $100 million B-class asset. You buy, you get 80% bridge debt, two years with one year extension option. Uh, and uh, today, easily, it's a 20% discount on value, maybe more to that, that asset. So now it's worth $80 million. Uh, debt today is 60% leverage, not 80. So now you're at $48 million. So you, how do you refi an $80 million loan with $48 million next year? You're screwed. Uh, and who is screwed? Is the equity screwed? The PREF screwed? The MES screwed? The B piece on the A note screwed? Screwed? Or are we talking about the A note? And so then you're talking about the special servicer. So I think all that has to get played out, and it's going to be really interesting to watch that, and I think that's where there's going to be opportunity. But, but what you're saying is incredibly scary. So a guy bought a $100 million property last year, has $80 million Arbor Bridge, whatever, MF1, whoever did the bridge loan, and now he has, he's coming up to the end of his cycle, the end of next year, he has to refi that loan. Agency is not going to go past 60. Pref is not going to go past 80. What does he do? What's he going to do? Well, he may not be the one making the decision. <laughs> So, boys, if you're in that situation, these four have a lot of money, and if you want to do a deal, just know that Newmark is going to broker it, and we're going to do the debt for it. Just a disclaimer. Okay. Let, let's just talk. I don't want to spend too much time on, on, the, on, on the current. I just want to ask one, one question. Fixed, and we're going to go this way. Would you lend, borrow today fixed or floating? It depends. On what? Uh, it depends on whether you're buying a stabilized asset. Let's, or let's talk about a core asset, a stabilized core asset or a value asset. Let's, let's start with core. If, if you have a core asset today, which you can pick up, are you putting long-term fixed rate or are you going to put yourself out there and get a rate cap and take a floating rate loan? Yeah, so right now we're doing floating. And we're doing floating because we believe, as Russ said, that sometime next year uh, we're going to see rates um, uh, normalize somewhat, particularly treasuries. Just remember, treasuries were 270 at the end of July, right? And they're 420 today, whatever they are this morning. So they've gone up 150 bips in this very short amount of time. Why? Because in July, actually it came down from three and a half because there was a sense that inflation would start coming under control. I think as soon as we get some positive news along that line, uh, if somebody was overthrown in Russia, um, that uh, you could see treasuries rally. So I, I think that treasuries are going to rally and that those rates will come down for fixed rate debt sooner than SOFA will. But, but, and we'll come to Harry right after this. Practically, you're not seeing that, right? We've had four rate hikes, five rate, six rate hikes over and over, and inflation isn't coming down because you've got one hand the Fed, and then you've got the government uh, giving out money like it's charity. They're giving billions of dollars to Ukraine, student loan forgiveness. So you've got two opposing things dealing with the same problem. So we haven't seen inflation come down. There should be another rate hike in December. Who's to say inflation comes down? We've pumped trillions how of did, dollars. How, how does them giving money to Ukraine impact they, they, our inflation? They, they keep on printing money. They keep on printing and giving out money to everybody. So with the more money, got, we're, we're, we have a freight train of inflation where they're printing When they're using it in this country, but they're, it they're, impacts inflation. Right, but they're doing and they give it to but, Ukraine. Is right, it, fine. I just want to know. Is right. it, that, that maybe that's a very good point. Giving it to Ukraine, I don't understand why we keep on giving I money to Ukraine. I think it's energy. But, that's another discussion. Right. So what are you saying? And it's, energy is causing inflation. By the yeah. way, now you know why Britain is falling apart. So <laughs> this, leaders like this. Okay, right. 
<laughs> I've been here for 22 years, so I'm okay. I've actually just got my American passport, so I consider myself an American. <laughs> After 20 years. Harry, fixed or floating? Well, it, most times in our situation, it's up to the uh, investor, uh, but we typically like to stay short-term and floating. And what we're doing now, we have a little different strategy. We're using, we're doing low leverage loans and then resizing the loan as, as, as uh, rates are more favorable. Russ? We are 100% fixed rate in our portfolio today. And, and what's, the average, what's the average cost over that portfolio? It's very reasonable. What it is, is it? not, it is, is, I don't it? want to say what Why it is, not? but, it's, we're all but friends. It's, it's, it is uh, very low compared to today's rates. It's ha less than half of what a new loan would, would be today. Um, but you have no, you don't have the flexibility of, of being able to, well, now you will, because if you can assume well, a low, the real flexibility, low the real flexibility that we're considering is just buy unleveraged, and then when rates go down, then put fixed rate debt on it. Exactly. Nice to be I mean, I think that's the, that's, that's the way to, you know, that's one way to do it, in, as opposed to doing, uh, to do floating rate. Joe, fixed or, I, well, go ahead. So, for going forward, portfolio-wise, um, we're only going to be looking at low leverage, assumable, preferably fixed. Um, when we're taking advantage of distress, I'm going to go with uh, short-term floaters. Okay, that's a good plan. All right, we're going to go into like quick-fire questions. We've spoken about the market. Let's go back in your history, and let's give some advice to our young Padawans over here. What advice, Russ, we'll start with you. What advice would you give that person today, knowing what you know now? What would you tell yourself when you first started out in the business, be it in 1991, I think, now, you're a little bit long in the tooth, a little older, still very handsome. What would you tell that young boy starting in the business? Do it. Do it. Do it. If you're thinking about it, you're not sure, do it. Don't forget about risk management, but do it. Joe, what would you tell yourself when you had more hair? Same thing. You've got you to gotta go. You've you got to go for it. You know, at the end of the day, it's about being in the equity position, not being in drawing a salary. Sorry, you've got to be in the equity position, not drawing you a salary. You want to be an owner, not an employee. I love that. Harry, what would you tell the younger person? Be careful. And, uh, <laughs> but ag aggressively careful uh, in your underwriting so that you, so your reputation is not... So know your numbers. Solid. Know, your, know the numbers, do the numbers, and then jump. There you go. I think and that's don't very push your numbers. You what? know, a lot of people say, well, I, I really like this deal. Let's figure out how we can make this deal work. And the answer is don't push your numbers. The numbers are what they are. Norm? So I have two pieces of advice. Uh, the first is echoing what uh, uh, Ross and, and Joe have talked about. Uh, but I want to put a little, uh, spin on it. I've had so many young people come to me in the last few years and say, I want to start in the business. What do you suggest? And I've always told them, it's never a great idea to start a business at the peak. And I think this is the time when, um, when, um, when things are uh, um, uh, changing, when there's opportunity is knocking. So if you're thinking about starting a business, I think this is the perfect time to start it. I, I, I just want to say it's never easy. Never. Right? It's, it's, it's never easy. It, it is tough, and I think we have all been very fortunate over the last 10 or 12 years because almost no matter what your underwriting was, you did well if you bought something in the last 10 or 12 years. And I think risk management and the, and the underwriting is going to make a bigger difference going forward. Because I don't think we're going to get the, uh, you know, we all think we're so smart because the last 10 or 12 years, we, we were, we, almost every deal succeeded. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be harder, I think. Going forward. But all of us started in cycles before this, and, and so we saw that and understood that. So many people who started four or five years ago only saw this upside and think they're brilliant. And so I think that uh, that's there's, really there's a great Bravo TV show called Below Deck. Yeah. And one of the captains was talking about how sailors never learn things in calm seas. So I think, Norman, that's what you're saying. Yeah. I, I, I love is. that. First, I, I deal, first deal I did, I bought from the bank. And Joe, got the Joe, bank to Joe, give you Joe, you're going to my next question. Well, Sorry. I, got second, I got a second point, and it's an important one. It's really important. I've, I've met so many people in the, that started in this business just in the last few years, and you've, uh, they've seen how easy, and I'm putting it in quotes because Russell, you know, correct me because he's correct, he's right. It's not easy, but how easy it seemed to make money because everything was going up. 
And so you operate it out of spreadsheets. I can get debt here this way. I can buy at a higher cap rate. I have a positive arbitrage. I can raise the rents. I can do all these things. I can cut costs. But you're forgetting the most fundamental thing about our business. And that is our business is to provide a family a home. And if you get that right, everything else will fall into place. But what I'm afraid of when I see too often is so many people coming through this business forgetting what our business really is. It's to make money. We all want to make money. But our, what our business is to provide a family a home. Let's make sure it's clean, it's safe, and it's a value that they can afford. And that will make, uh, make you a success in this business. So fantastic segment of great advice. Jump in, do your numbers, provide a home, love all that. But guys, how did you go from your first apartment building to 100,000 100, units. How, how do you make that jump? It's easy to buy one. How do you make that jump? Joe, you were saying about your first building, and I interrupted you. So do you want to go back to that? Sure. Um, well, I'll make a long story short, which is uh, basically came home one day and told my wife um, that I was going to stop working for someone and give up what at the time was a really pretty darn good job. And we were going to buy 144 units that were 30 years old in St. Petersburg <laughs> in a deal that was in default. And my wife patted me on the back, said, honey, I know we can do it. And she cried for two weeks thereafter. <laughs> um, but uh, um, you know, the, the short answer, which sounds corny, is, is be cautious and work your tail off. You know, everyone talks about good luck being the interception of you know, preparedness and opportunity. And, and I really think that's it. You know, um, the first deal, I worked my tail off. I mean, I was taking calls in the middle of the night, and I was the leasing guy. And I remember I put up a sign that said, another fine landmark apartment. And of course, it was the only fine landmark apartment. <laughs> but, um, you know, one became three, and three became 10, and 10 became 20. And then, you know, I got to 5,000 units, sold 3,000 in the right time, plowed it back in, and kept growing the company. And you've got to reinvest. And the other thing that I think is critical is build your company and your culture. And one thing, you know, that I think we all share up here is that we've got team members who have supported us, who have also not only um, worked with us, but also corrected us when the time was right. And, you know, you've got to listen to those underwriters when they say this isn't going to work or we're not going to get this deal done and build the team and build the culture. And Norman makes a very good point. At the end of the day, you've got several constituencies to serve. Of course, you've got your investors, you've got your team members, but first and foremost, you've got your customers. Russ, how did you go to building your behemoth company? You know, mine was different, I think, than others. Yeah. I, did, I didn't start with one. I, I started at a big financial institution, and we used their money initially to start buying deals and ultimately spun the business out of that financial institution. So we started a little differently. We always had institutional investors as our clients. We actually had this large financial institution. It, we started using their money. So I, I didn't, we, we had a little different start and model, Joe, than you did. But still very valid. But Harry, how did you go to build a company with 100,000 apartments under management and 60,000 units under ownership? Well, I had From a... From Des Moines, Iowa, right? <laughs> right, that's right. From started, Des Moines, yeah. Iowa. Uh, so uh, I quit the law practice in 92 and uh, spent the next year in an office the size of this chair <laughs> uh, and next to a... Uh, a psychologist that used the primal scream method of treatment. <laughs> so uh, I was listening. It was like, uh, you know, old faithful. But at any rate, uh, I had a friend that had knew somebody who went bankrupt in the 80s. He had a deal in San Antonio in the 90s. So I had never been to Texas before. I flew down and um, to look at this deal, this guy's background looked like a Civil War battlefield, so he couldn't raise money. So I, I met a Dallas broker for the first time. And as we were driving through, I said, well, this kind of looks like a B property in a B area. And you know, in that old Texas look, he said, you don't need Michael Jordan to win a pickup game. <laughs> That's what he told me. So basically he said, as far as I'm concerned, within your area, you got an A property in an A area. So went ahead and bought it, went to the closing. In those days, you had to be at the closing. And so I was, and my whole life uh, turned on one, uh, one question. And I said, I asked the owner, it was a savings and loan. It was, I said, guy, and I said, uh, Dave, would you like to go to dinner? And he said, I'd love to, but I got to go to a closing. And I said, well, 
it's five o'clock. What closing are you going to? He says, I'm going to a closing for your deal. And I said, I thought we were at the closing for our deal. He said, I go to the home loan bank. They give me the difference between my mortgage and what you're paying me. So I looked at him and I said, you don't care what the price is. Nope. And I said, do you have any more of these? He had four. So we made a deal right there on the other four. That's amazing. So that's how I got started. And they were low priced. So we were very successful and we ran it that way. That's so crazy that that, that closing. You one question. That, one question. Wow. <laughs> amazing how your life can turn out. Norm, how did you go to build 30,000 units, sell 30,000 units, 10 hotels? How did you get your start? Well, it was 1994. And like Harry, I was uh, an attorney. I was general counsel for a real estate company that had a um, net lease on a hotel. Uh, that was the Four Seasons Hotel in Atlanta, 53 stories, hotel, office, and condo tower. Uh, and the deal had gone belly up. The developer went under, the bank uh, went under, and it was actually seized by the Swedish government's RTC. And so I was in negotiation for my client to, to work things out with the uh, Swedish RTC, and, and we couldn't work things out. And the, um, uh, the um, Swedes had hired a Holocaust survivor who grew up in Sweden after Germany and um, uh, as their lawyer and he spoke to me in Yiddish uh, at a negotiation said Nochum, we want to uh, buy we want to sell it to you <laughs> not to your clients and we went outside the room and we made a deal right there and, and I, we made a deal to buy a 53 story building I was 30 something years old I had you know a mortgage I had two cars you know uh, loaned up to the hilt, I had credit cards maxed out, and here I'm buying a 53-story uh, building. <laughs> and uh, to add to that, um, um, my equity walked away two weeks before closing. How did you close? So um, I was at the bar of the Four Seasons where I had to be, because it's the only way I could make this deal. And uh, I think someone's here from Silver Peak, Ari's from Silver Peak, uh, um, uh, Mark Walsh flew down. He was the head of Lehman's Global uh, uh, real estate then, though global meant like two properties. They didn't have much then. And he came down at the bar at the Four Seasons on a cloth napkin. We made a deal for $20 million, nine points, 20% interest rate, and 20% of the deal. That's why I needed a drink to sign that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to sign that. And, uh, and uh, that's how we, uh, we went right from napkin to closing. Uh, and I found out later that it was... Um, had uh, LBHI loan number, Lehman Brothers Holding Inc. loan number 0001. So if you want to blame real, uh, why we went, went into under. real estate and went under, <laughs> it's because our deal was so successful. Russ, we've had three amazing stories. I, I can't let you get away with, with nothing about how you've grown and being so humble. You've got to impart to the crowd how you got your start, how did you get into the business. There must be an amazing story there as well. I just want to say what Joe said. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And the more you give. The more we're gonna come to giving. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you're taking all the questions away. So you just worked hard. That's how you got your start. Okay. Joe, I'm gonna start with you. You started with no money. How did you go on to getting Electro Capital, this huge Israeli institution, to be your partner? How did you make the jump from passing the hat to huge institutional equity players? So it's, it was a step-by-step -step process, but of course the reality of growing through that step-by-step -step process is track record. You know, just don't do bad deals. Don't talk yourself into doing deals that don't work. So I started literally every penny that my wife and I had and every penny that my mentor at the time had, and we bought one building. And uh, then we went to the proverbial country club money. You know, you'd go to a meeting at a doctor's house and there'd be 20 doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, and you'd have 30 limited partners, and they'd each write a check for, at that time, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Um, and then we, we went through that process. And then I was very lucky, again, I had the great opportunity um, uh, to uh, get hooked up with Brookfield. And Brookfield became a, a major sponsor for us and led to many big institutional relationships. Get to fast forward to 2007, we're doing great, we've got a great platform, we've got a lot of portfolio, and we had um, you know, a lot of good dry powder, but we wanted to grow it. And uh, through a mutual friend, I was introduced to uh, the principles of uh, the Israeli company, um, Electra, and that family, which is a principal family in Israel. And uh, 
they said, uh, we want to buy half your platform. And I said, great. I sold it, in my opinion, for too little, in their opinion, for too much. But we've now been partners since 2007, and we continue to grow the platform with um, both uh, Israeli institutional money, all the major Israeli institutions, and now globally, we have a uh, capital markets office in New York, one in Tel Aviv, one in Dubai. And it's now really, we made the transition from direct institutional joint ventures into discretionary funds. And discretionary funds really gives you the ability to act swiftly. And I've found that uh, I'm rarely the high bidder, but I'm usually the most reliable and I'm usually the fastest. Once we make a decision, we can go hard very quickly and that helps buying. So that was a transition and it's taken, you know, I started in 95, so it's a long time. So it's building bricks to get to that. Building bricks and, and again, the question we get today all the time is, let's see your track record. And I've got the track record listing every deal, what we paid, what we made, what the NOI growth was going back to 1995. Russ, you started with this. So he just wants to make me look like my job was easy. It does. I started with you the started institutions, with, with right? You started with doctors and lawyers and We started with the institutions, And you just right? came Goldman Sachs and here's money. I, 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 actually, well, well, there's well, many routes to success well, is the well, answer. Well, well, actually, when we went to do our first transaction, but you, and I were, I, this was seven, right? You're on, you're on fund ten, ten, ten. And you've raised ten, you've raised no, no, ten we've been at, We've been around for 31 yeah. years now. But literally, to do our first transaction, we bought a portfolio of multifamily lines uh, loans from a bank that were under collateralized or, or in default. And to do the deal at the time I was working for a firm called First Boston that was merged into Credit Suisse. And it was before really kind of the email was so big. And to do the deal, which was a 20 some odd million dollar deal, I think we, were, we had a loan from a credit company, a non-recourse loan to to fund the debt side, I think we needed seven or eight million dollars approximately. In order to get that done, not only did I have to go to my boss who headed the mortgage department, his boss who headed fixing up department, had to go up to the president of the firm to make a presentation. You know, these firms today, you think how much, you know, how, how much money goes back and forth trading. You hear about hundreds of millions, billions of dollars traded. Between seven and eight million dollars, I had to make a presentation in person to the president of the firm. That was our first deal. But principle. So you made the presentation, but talk us through the ten funds, the amount of money you've raised. These are all different institutions that are you giving know, you money today. Our, our clientele is mostly uh, pension plans, insurance companies, university endowments, healthcare systems, um, religious entities, and you know every time, Joe, as you said, every time you know, and they have consultants on top of that. Every time you got to sit down and talk about what your strategy is and why you're well positioned to execute the strategy, what your track record is, mm -hmm. uh, what the risks involved in the strategy are. And, you know, you, like anything else, it's, it's ultimately about, con, you know, showing people your track record, how you, you, you expect to continue to perform, and build trust. Because ultimately, the business is really about trust. And I think this is one of the, the last humanistic business where people are investing in you, what you've accomplished, what you've done, what you've shown in your past. And they're saying, OK, here's money for you to go continue doing what you've done, but on a much greater scale. Would you agree with that, Harry? Absolutely. How did you, how did you get Invesco and all those well, monster I, firms? <laughs> we had a small group of investors. I ended up buying a property from a guy in the Midwest. He was, a, uh, he was from DC. He had a pretty good portfolio of properties. He liked our discussion, our negotiation. We became friendly, and he had access to a lot of capital, and that's kind of how we got started. And from there, once you gain a reputation like Joe did and others, and uh, it starts looking for you as opposed to you looking for it. So and, today uh, you have people coming to you offering you money well, rather we, than you passing the hat and asking them for money. We did some pretty big deals with some pretty big operators. and. Um, just doing a good job and making money, if I'm <laughs> making money for them, and then they start uh, looking towards you. And if you're part of the industry, uh, and, and we, didn't, we didn't have a big fund, we uh, had different investment groups and isolated the investment types, and then we would approach them that way. Norm? Well, you know, it's not just about your reputation of making money and having successful deals. I'm sure we all can talk about our successful deals but it's also what happens when things don't go right. And, uh, and, and what kind of person are you when that happens? And Joe's name came up 
just recently with, uh, with me. Uh, you were compared to me, Joe, so I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> but that um, you were doing a deal, that, this is what I heard in the street, that you were doing a deal this year, like started in like March or something, and markets went to turmoil. You had ev everyone else was retrading, everyone else was going back and negotiating, and you stood firm and said, no, that's my word, and I'm going to do the deal. And so, yeah, you could have probably retraded and taken um, a discount, but you didn't because you're in it for the long haul and you want your reputation to mean more than, um, uh, than uh, how much money you may make on one particular transaction. So I think, I think um, our reputations are bigger than our successes. They're also about our word. So I think that's really important. I actually have a different story about raising capital. I started, of course, Lehman Brothers was my first uh, equity uh, partner, and after that it was all by word. Lehman backed me on, on most of my deals and some other Wall Street shops as well. Uh, and then when I came out with um, uh, uh, the multifamily uh, um, um, platform in 2010, I went back to Wall Street, had a good reputation, great relationships, and went up uh, to ask for capital and small checks like Russ was going for. And, <laughs> and um, most said they were out of business, but some would fly down to Atlanta. Um, they would uh, go see the deal, we'd go see the market comps, I'd take them to an expensive dinner. Five days later, three analysts, um, some who spoke English, would start writing, you know, 20, 30 question emails, like, you know, why a, a magnolia tree, why not an oak tree, what's the ROI on a magnolia tree versus an oak tree, and I'm going, you know. And, um, and so go through all this, and at the end of the day, I'd get an email, oh, it's in Atlanta. And I said, well, I'm going to tell the mayor to make the sign bigger at the airport. <laughs> you know, or it's too big, it's too small, it's too old, it's too new. Stuff that was on the front page of, of the investment memo. It was not, it was not a, something buried below that, oh, a, a eureka moment, we found something. It was always something right on the cover. So um, I went up, and I'll tell you the true story. I went up to see Ron Kravitz at, uh, um, uh, what was Ron? Uh, Cerberus. At Cerberus. And I've known Ron for so long, and so I decided to change, this is 2011, I decided to change my tack, and I, I started by asking him a question, Ron, what's your box? What's your investment box today? And we're in this huge conference table in, in Cerberus, and he puts his arms on the table and puts his hands together in the shape of a box, and he describes the four corners of his box. This is the returns he wants, the size of the equity check, the age of the property, where it's, if it's core, whatever. And he does the four corners of the box. He's holding it right there. And I said, Ron, hold it right there. And I go to my briefcase and I said, I've got a deal <laughs> squarely in the center of your box. <laughs> and this is what happens. The box I said, moves. the box moved. <laughs> and I said, Ron, what just happened? He said, we're really not in business. We don't have the equity right now. We don't understand this market. Um, and uh, <laughs> we just wanted to learn what's going on from you. Um, and so we had been raising capital by passing the hat, mostly through brokers, uh, friends of mine who've known me for years, uh, in the first few deals. And I decided then I have to go into the uh, equity raising business myself. And so we just started raising deal by deal from the doctors and lawyers and, and uh, many of the Wall Street guys who um, couldn't invest with us uh, um, through their institutions. Uh, and this year alone, we're going to raise about $260 million uh, in um, private equity ourselves on a deal-by-deal deal basis. And all week long, one of my friends who's a top real estate litigator has been telling me great things how he's about you, by the way. Uh, thank you, Russ. So this kind of leads me to my, my next question. Gentlemen, you've done unbelievably well. What is your secret sauce. Joe, is it that you don't retrade when you have the opportunity? Russ, is it your background? Harry, is it your sweet, gentle demeanor? Norman, is it your great jacket? What is your secret sauce? Russ, you want to go? What, what, what What's is wrong with my jacket? It's, it's <laughs> no, 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 no. nothing special. <laughs> but what, 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 seriously, guys, what, what, is, what is your secret sauce? If someone says to you, what has propelled you to your success? What is your Midas touch? What is it? I think persistence. I think there's something about persistence. I think it's, it's, it always feels like you're swimming upstream until you hit the finish line. And I, I think you just can't quit. I just think you gotta keep pushing, 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 and it always feels hard until after the fact. Love that, don't give up. Harry, what's your secret sauce? Oof, <laughs> um, well, I think, 
you know, honesty and being very straightforward is, is, is something that we've, we've always done. Uh, probably the best thing that's happened in the last seven or eight years is I hired this uh, woman. She's an MBA level person. She's done a spectacular job and she's, she supplements all the problems, uh, issues that I have or the, the def deficiencies that I have, she has, uh, so it's created a good interchange there and we've been able to um, pull in some bi uh, big, bi good business. Joe? I'll like second what's been said. First, keep your word, and second, surround yourself with people smarter than you are. Norm, what's your secret sauce? Joe took the words right out of my mouth and, uh, and uh, well, it's because we're the same age. So I think we came up the same way, but truly it's um, your word, I think it's what Russ said, your perseverance. This is not an easy business. Any of you in it know it. It's not an easy business, and you have to keep trying. Things are, and you know, by the way, you know, the um, business plans, they're like uh, battle plans in the Army. Uh, the minute uh, you buy a property, throw it in the garbage, and you have to start again. And you have to be willing to be a change agent and not be married to your business plan. I tell you that, um, I was, um, for those of you who don't know, in, in 2006, I, um, I sold everything I had, like I did last year, and uh, in the condo business, and went into the workout business. And for nine months, like the Maytag repairman, for those of you old enough, nobody called, I was very lonely. But once Bear Stearns started to have its hiccups, I got the call because no one was really in the workout business in 2006 and seven, And so I became the uh, workout provider for Lehman in bankruptcy for most of their residential assets, which were um, enormous. And, um, and so I tried to do an analysis of what was wrong with all these properties. I, was, I mean, dozens and dozens, I mean, huge. Five, you know, remember Russ then, it was 500 million had to be the de minimum deal side for anyone on Wall Street to do it. So all these $500 million deals, which was a lot of money in 2007 and eight. And, um, and I tried to figure out what was wrong. So I'm not a computer literate guy. I put, took oak tag, put all these easels up in the conference room, and I said, okay, what was wrong with this asset? And they go, oh, the, um, it was undercapitalized. Okay, we, eight deals were undercapitalized. And then, oh, what was wrong with this deal? Oh, the uh, developer was a crook and, and uh, stole the money. I said, okay, got that. And we went down the list and had all these different uh, sheets of oak tag, and six on one, eight on another, three on the other, but one, one, had every single asset on it, one. And that was the developer refused to change the business plan when faced with different circumstances. People wouldn't change the business plan. And I remember foreclosing on someone, it was a friendly foreclosure, we were waiving the um, personal guarantees and giving some parting gifts, and in exchange they had to you know, uh, cooperate with me, and it was an asset in LA, $500 million condo conversion, 1,294, 1980 units that were being, uh, uh, they used a securitized loan, busted all five phases at once, the place was a mess, it's early, uh, late 2008, I'm sitting down with the developer, and I tried to be nice, I said, tell me, I don't know LA, you know the market, you've done a lot of deals, what would you do differently if you were me, what would you do differently? And he got red-faced, he got red-faced, <coughs> and he pounded the table, the water started to, uh, to uh, shake on the, and spill over on the table. And he said, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I did everything right. But Norman, we're in a transitional period today. How are you changing your business plan right now? Exactly, what are you doing? And this is a great, this Be is actually my next hotels. question. <laughs> what, what are you doing now? And this is a great question for the audience who have not seen a downturn. It's been seven years of fat. Right. What would you do now if you have a 4,000 unit portfolio like Sol or any of these guys, or, what would you do to your 4,000 unit portfolio or 5,000 unit portfolio? What is your advice today? What? Sell your yeah, exactly. Right, he, he got out. But Joe, what, what do you, would you advise these guys right now? What, what, are, what should they do? Cut expenses? These guys already cut so much expenses. Who's going to fix the toilets? Their wives? They already run so lean. What are you going to tell them to do? Well, I know it sounds corny, but I do believe in getting into the weeds. Um, and I've always said, you know, the answer uh, to success is not an arbitrage, but an operations. And you really got to be in the weeds. And uh, particularly, you know, for those of you who have made the mistake of over leveraged, you know, just I think the best advice is um, wave the red flag at the right time 
with your lenders, with your partners, let them know what's happening, keep them in the loop, be a thousand percent honest, figure out solutions, and as, as Norm said, you got to figure out here's going to be the answer. I've got to get from path A, point A to point B, and point A to point B is going to involve some recap, some refi, some solution. Everyone's going to get hurt. We're going to be fair about it. I'll take my piece of the, of the pain. And, um, you know, that's why I've always avoided over leverage. But a lot of people were tempted by taking a bite out of that apple. And we all know what happens uh, when you take the bite out of Eve's apple. I was just going to say, Joe, you, you, said, you, you said that uh, pay attention to the operations. With us, details always mattered. Whether it was details, Harry, you mentioned in the underwriting, whether it's details on operations, but for us, it's always been you make your money in the details or you can lose a lot of money. We've seen circumstances where people sort of inverted the negative in underwriting and it meant that they underwrote much more income. It was a, supposed to be an expense. We've seen that from people and then, then they've paid more money than in hindsight they would have liked to have paid. Again, in the last 12 years, it probably didn't matter that much. No, but I, I think now it's going to matter more. And I think tenant retention is going to be a huge factor. Because right. if you turn units, if you're turning 50, 60% of units each year, you've got to pay leasing. You've got to fix up the unit. You've got to find a way now to keep your tenants, right, Harry? You've got to keep them there to keep your expenses low. And even if you're running incredibly lean, how do you keep your tenants in your building? How, because like you but, said, but Norman. Some, but some of those expenses are, are really not controllable, right? Insurance is pretty hard to control. Property taxes are pretty hard to control. In many markets, those are the two that are really getting out of hand. Right. I, I'll tell you, though, uh, I, I think the point you were making is the right one. Um, the last two years, I, you know, I got a call from a lender six months ago. drove me nuts. They were calling about a reference of a, bar, a borrower, wanted me to give reference to the borrower, but I asked them about the deal. And they were buying a 1960 barrack-style Class D apartment in a politely tertiary location, uh, and they were so excited they were paying a four and a quarter cap. And uh, I said, but what's your cost of, of debt? I said, oh, we're a six and a half. I said, well, you're buying a six and a quarter and you're, you're buying a four and a quarter, uh, six buying a four, yeah. and you're putting six and a half. And he said, yeah, but we have 20% lease trade outs. And I go, well, that's not going to last. And so I, I think my, um, uh, this 20%, 15%, 10% rent growth year after year after year, you're willing to sacrifice occupancy to get it. I think today, get the heads in beds, keep them in those beds, and build up as much cash reserve as you can because you're going to need it. Harry, how, how are you keeping your tenants, in, how are you keeping your heads in beds? Uh, well, what we've, what we've been doing is we've been uh, changing the dynamic of the property uh, with, with, uh, work, with work from home, and things like that. We've created many WeWorks in a lot of our properties. We're trying to improve the product uh, to meet the lifestyle requirements. And that's kind of what our, what we've been, that's one of the fit techniques we've been using. And is it working? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So that improve makes all the, the difference. We're trying to improve there. their environment so that they'll stay. Okay, we're down to the last five minutes. So, so quick snap questions, quick answers. What was your, Joe, what was your biggest missed opportunity? <laughs> there's a good question. Um, there's, there's been a million of them. Um, biggest, biggest missed opportunity was not doing what Norm did and sell everything last year. <laughs> Russ, what was your biggest missed opportunity? You know, I, I, I don't know what it is, but there clearly were lines of business that we could have expanded into that, that, that would have, you know, potentially grown our business bigger, but we didn't want to be the biggest shop. Harry? Uh, we had the potential to buy a big property, a couple of properties in Chattanooga uh, that um, this was just a year yeah. or two ago and um, we just couldn't quite get there. Because of it, the location? Great location, great properties, but the, uh, our investor was hesitant about Chattanooga and it, it's turned out to be a great deal. Yeah. Norm? Well, back uh, 10 years ago, we should have bought five times more than we bought. And the, re <laughs> and the reason we didn't, I, I, and I believed in it, was our underwriters, I had a partner who was an underwriter who 
um, was so stuck in the past and not the future. So he couldn't model the rent growth to make deals work. And I know we've turned deals down, and this will, everybody will laugh here, for like twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars total price, we walked away from deals. Joe, and, what was your? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. That, that, yeah, that's, we that's, learned that th lesson, Norman. You know, you're never that smart for the last twenty-five thousand dollars. We've learned that lesson over the years too. But would we follow that question, Joe? What was your biggest money maker? Uh, probably it should be this should be fit under the limited disclosure, but. Uh, Obviously, the sale of our public company to Starwood was a great payday for everybody involved. <laughs> and the smart decision I made at that time, they wanted to buy my operating platform. Said no. And I said no. Yep. Russ, what was your biggest money maker? You know, we did, we did a bunch of, we, we were fortunate early in the early 90s to buy a lot of defaulted debt that worked out really well. And, you know, quite frankly, the last two years, was pretty darn good. It didn't really get much better than what we saw over the last couple of years. We had a 1,520 in a property in Virginia, and it made a nine-digit uh, <laughs> profit in a, in a four or five years. Amazing. Norm? Yeah, I, um, the uh, week that the Atlanta Braves announced that they were going to build the battery and move their stadium, uh, a broker came up to me with a... Uh, a busted tick deal, 29 acres immediately adjoining what would become the battery. Uh, it had no cash flow, there's no P&L, they didn't have keys, um, uh, the place was a mess. 90% of the crime in the city of Smyrna occurred from uh, people living in the property or uh, on, it occurred on the property and it was a no call list, the police wouldn't come there. Uh, and I took out my checkbook and I wrote that check right on the spot, whatever they wanted. Uh, and it was the uh, greatest deal I've ever done. The Braves then invested 1.6 billion in that <laughs> development, and uh, and uh, we did very well. So hear that, gentlemen. You can buy a really rubbish property and be so lucky. Quick question: Which markets surprise you in their growth, and which markets do you wish you never entered, Joe? So, um, two of my favorite markets um, that I had confidence in early on were Tampa and Jacksonville. And I remember going to New York and making the rounds with the institutions, and I'd say, you know, we want to buy properties in Jacksonville, and they'd say, now, is that in Florida or Georgia? Uh, you know, they really hadn't figured it out yet, um, and Florida wasn't on the map. So I'd say, those are two that I don't know surprised me, but I think that we, you know, held a key to those early on. Um, I can't say there's any market, and I've been very cautious, and I've been in the same markets for 25 years and not expanded. So I have to say, I've been very happy with the markets we're in. Um, the only one that um, I've been concerned about is, you know, city of Austin um, in the city limits. Um, but that's another story for another day. Russ, which market surprised you in the growth? Which markets do you wish you'd never entered? Florida is the market that continues to surprise me in its growth. Any, almost anywhere. Jacksonville, we knocked it out of the park. Uh, but South Florida is, uh, is, is just amazing. The amount of income, you know, it's amazing. You, if you look at the population migration, you know, Florida's great, but so is Texas. But if you look at the income migration, it's, what's happening in Florida is, is just amazing. We continue to see strong rent growth, right, even right now, when many markets are, are flattening. Um, so I would say Florida is the market that, that potentially has had... Uh, uh, the biggest positive surprise, the, the, the toughest market we're in probably from a residential standpoint is um, New York City, and in particular, a lot of the changes in the rent regulations. And I think that's been a real challenging market. I think, you know, rent regulations as a whole can create challenges broadly. Let's go. Harry? Uh, probably market. our most successful markets have been uh, our portfolios in Dallas and Houston and uh, Austin. Uh, the biggest problem we also had was in Texas, and that was Midland, yeah. uh, when the oil, 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 and that's, oil and gas went down. Heavy tethered to that. It's good now, but uh, yeah, energy it, was, prices. It, it was a problem. Midland, Odessa, Texas. I once flew there, and I was wearing Gucci loafers, and a uh, guy <laughs> covered in tattoos and a biker jacket walked on and looked at me and goes, that guy's lying on the loafers. I didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, Norm? Well, on the, best, on, the, on the good side, I think I agree with Russ, 
the big surprise to me is Miami in South Florida because if you go back all the years that I go back, it's boom bust, boom bust, boom bust, and um, and but it's really become an incredibly dynamic market. And I, while there's always going to be cycles, even in South Florida, I think what's happened down here has been a dramatic change from the history of the last 50 years of this market. And I think that's something that's going to be. Um, you know, long term. So, so I think you, that's... You are very long on Miami. Very long on Miami. I'm glad I bought my condo. I, I think there are a number of markets that used to be highly cyclical that have had huge diversification in their economies, have strong fiscal conditions in their municipalities, and have really strengthened. And you look at Miami, look, Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta. Atlanta. Really, Atlanta? Phoenix? I mean, a lot, a lot of markets. up and down. No, Phoenix <laughs> isn't. It's really diversified its economic base. And, you know, now with all the chip manufacturing moving, you know, between Taiwan and Intel, I mean, it's, it's really kind of, it, I mean, I, yes, from a supply standpoint, it's, it, there's, there's surges. But I think a lot of these uh, Sun Belt markets have seen a broadening of the economic base that's, that's really different and will change that cyclicality. I, I agree. Now, and, my, and downside, you, and you, my downside is San Antonio. San Antonio, San Antonio, really? Antonio, it looks great on paper. It's growing all the same ways, the demographics, everything like that, but it, it's so spread out um, and uh, we, we never got traction there. It's a, I call it a red herring. Okay, Cyclone, don't listen to that, or Harbor, we've sold you guys a lot in San Antonio. Final question, final question. And I think, and I love asking this question because it's so important. You've been blessed with great gifts, blessed with great success. How do you leave your mark on the world? How do you repay the success you've been given? How do you make your little world a better place for your fellow man? If you could just spend two seconds of what you do to give back, I think it's so inspiring. It's a great way to end this. Joe, what, what do you do to, to repay everything you've been, all the gifts you've been given? Well, I've been very blessed and I'm very lucky. And, and uh, you know, rule number one was uh, always give to the point where it hurts. And whether you call it sadaka or whether you call it tithing or whether you call it karma, there's no question that the more you give, the more you get. And um, I've proven that. Um, I followed the rule with my kids, give them enough to do something but not enough to do nothing. And all the rest is fair game. Um, you know, we support a number of various things uh, on a global basis. Um, I'm certainly involved in a lot of Jewish charitable enterprises, a lot of university enterprises, and a lot of medical. I'm a diabetic, so I'm involved in that, but my advice to everybody is give till it hurts. Russ? I like that. I That's love great. that. I yeah, love I, I just want to focus on family. I want to focus on family. I think the real important thing is uh, we, we've moved down to Florida to be with our family, and I just want to, and I Joe, you mentioned it too, but... I really want to focus on family. Harry? Well, we're, <laughs> we give away a lot of money, let's put it that way. And uh, we're also involved in a lot of projects in our hometown and also internationally. I'm involved with the International Crisis Group in a pretty big way. And um, so those are the things that we do. Norm, I know you're very involved as well. Well, we're, I, I combine what uh, uh, Russ's uh, focus on family and uh, Joe's um, um, emphasis on giving till it hurts by involving my family in, in giving so that we create better bonds among us. We don't always agree. We try to create pillars um, and we try to focus on things that we all can agree on. Uh, and um, so we uh, uh, both um, really improve our family relationships. It gives me confidence that the second and third generations will be just as philanthropic in giving the causes that I believe in uh, and that they are learning to believe in. Uh, and, um, and yet at the same time, we're improving the world. And yes, you know, uh, many causes in Israel and uh, the Jewish community, but also um, housing insecurity, giving back. We, as um, being in this industry, you know, giving back to homeless organizations in a meaningful way, not just with our money, but with our, uh, our, our talents as well. I think is of primary importance. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time here tonight. And I hope you'll, I hope yeah. you'll, I hope you'll join us for lunch. And anyone who wants to ask any more questions can follow. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Heshi.